welcome to Healing Generations, a podcast creating a dialogue uplifting the importance of healing, strengthening, and supporting our communities, and that addresses the disparities and inequities in communities of color. Healing Generations is brought to you by the Healing Generations Institute, a collaborative initiative of the National Compadres Network and the Brotherhood of Elders. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on our new releases. Welcome, everyone, to our Healing Generations podcast, sponsored by our National Comadres Network. My name is Susana Armijo. I am coming to you from the Los Angeles, California area today, the land of the Tangva Gabrielino people. And I am just so thankful to be here with all of you once again. And so honored to be offering another podcast from our Healing Generations archives, uh, featuring a very dedicated mujer, a powerful advocate for women across the nation. She is Ms. Yari Acosta de Leon, who has dedicated many years of service to her community as well as to humanity. She continues to be an inspiration for so many of us, uh, sharing all of her hard-earned experience and wisdom on the power of letting go, trusting your intuition, uh, being in touch with empathy, compatience, and the power of surrender. We invite you to listen to this powerful episode once again in hopes that you will be inspired by her words of wisdom and that this conversation will be an inspiration to you wherever you are on your own healing journey and whatever you may be going through in this season for whatever reasons. Hopefully, you will be able to also share your hard-earned wisdom and pass it on to others to help bring healing and, and break those unhealthy cycles for the future generations to come, and hopefully it will help them for a lifetime. Welcome. I just want to welcome everyone today, and this is the National Compadres Healing Generations podcast hosted by the National Comadres Network. And we are so grateful that you are joining us today because we know that you could be doing a lot of things, but that choice to be with us means so much to us. So thank you. Thank you very much for spending this time with us. And also, I just want to say happy International Women's Day. And that's a big deal because there have been so many sacrifices from so many women to accomplish things that have gone unnoticed, that have gone with much, much energy dedication from women that we don't even know their names. So we want to honor them today in this precious day of National Women's Day. And with that, uh, I'm coming to you from the Bay Area, uh, San Francisco Bay Area, which is a lonely land. And um, those are the native people up here. And I'm doing pretty well today. And with that, Comadre, how are you doing down south over there? How's it going for you over there? Hi, Comadre. Actually, I'm giving thanks for um, all the water that we need over here in Los Angeles, California. Actually, today the a sunny day, so I'm giving thanks for that. Papa Sol up there, Tonatiu, uh, mm-hmm. trying to get as much energy as I can before the next storm hits. But I know we need that water here, you know, with the yes. drought situation. But I'm also just feeling really grateful. You know, you're expressing your gratitude for, for all the women, you know, International yes. Women's Day today. This morning when I woke up and I, I, I remembered that, I was just thinking of all the blessings that I've been given for all the powerful mujeres that have been placed in my life, uh, all the maestras, uh, all my friends, all the tias, all the abuelitas, Mm. all that circle of sisterhood of mujeres, as well as nieces and granddaughters that have blessed my life with so much medicine in so many ways and brought so much healing to me. So my heart is full, and I just hope every woman that's hearing this uh, today can just feel that love and uh, know that you're loved and you're being acknowledged, you're sacred, and and you're a blessing. Yes, that's so, so true, right? I mean, thank God for our grandmothers, right? Esos abuelitas, boy, you know, um, the blessings that they brought, all that wisdom, and for sisterhood, right? Mm -hmm. That sisterhood, and I'm so grateful, comadre, to be on this podcast with you and for the work that we've been able to do. So 
Yes, thank you very much for the sisterhood that we're able to share on this beautiful day. And with that, I'm very excited because we've got a wonderful guest again to just sit around this microphone and hear those teachings and hear those life experiences. And it's very exciting for me because, you know, we're bringing the West Coast in today, este, la Caribe, los caribeños, you know, which are a very important part of us, right? Because sometimes we don't talk about that Afro-Latino side sometimes, you know, we forget about that. But we're such beautiful people with an array, you know, we have a spectrum of who it is that we are. And so I'm very excited about that today. And I just want to say to our listeners... Today, you are going to hear something, and I know I repeat this over and over, but it's the truth. You're going to hear something that is going to touch your spirit and your heart and bring those words that you need to hear today and is going to bring healing to your life that you need today as we go on with this podcast. So with no further ado, comadre, let's introduce our guest for today. Absolutely, absolutely. She's a, a beautiful mujer, a powerful mujer. Uh, she's an hermana también. Uh, her name is Yari Acosta de Leon. Powerful name for a powerful mujer, but uh, yes. you deserve all of it, all of it. Uh, she is Dominican born, raised in the United States. She is currently married, been married for 23 years and mm. lives with her husband, Jewel, and her two beautiful daughters. She holds her master's degree in social work. She's also worked for many years as mental health specialist. She is a devoted and dedicated advocate to her culture, to her people, and especially to her community. So, Yari, hermana, such an honor, such an honor to be in your presence and, and to have you here to bless us all with all your hard-earned wisdom, your years of medicina, and all the ancestors that you come with, that you bring. So I'm just going to uh, pass the palabra to you and let you just share from your heart whatever comes out of your spirit. Uh, we're just having a plática like comadres here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> share a little bit about yourself, your familia, uh, your background, the work you're connected to, anything that comes from your heart. Thank you, thank you. Primero, gracias. You know, thank you for having me here today. I'm really excited to be, you know, a part of this conversation. I know that our culture and, you know, how we live our daily lives, it plays a role in the decisions and all the things that we do. But I feel so blessed being next to Maestra Debbie and next to Maestra Susie for allowing me to be in your circle and partaking in this conversation. Um, I said it earlier, you know, East Coast, West Coast love, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and uh, being, you know, uh, from the Caribe, um, you know, Maestra Debra, thank you so much for recognizing that. You know, I live on Long Island in New York. I live in a town called Holbrook, who is um, populated by so many indigenous. We have our, you know, in, uh, Native Americans, you know, all around us on this island. And sometimes it hurts when, you know, we see their struggle and the fight that they're doing in order to preserve what's true and what's theirs, you know. And us being here, you know, borrowing, you know, their land and living on their land, learning from them. But um, mm. thank you for recognizing, you know, that I am from the Caribe. You know, I am Dominican. I was born in the U.S., but I'm a first generation American. I was raised with both of my cultural backgrounds of the Dominican Republic. I spent most of my youth um, there. So I feel like I'm across of both worlds. But, um, you know, we hear so much about the history of other, like from the Incas and the Mayas and the Aztecs, you know, and sometimes people are not knowledgeable about, you know, the Tainos and the Arawaks, you know, you know, I guess because of their, their non-existence, you know, per se, you know, uh, where in other native lands, you know, the culture and the, the people are still alive, you know, and so integrated into the life and the culture where we in the Caribbean, you know, uh, we feel a little bit at a loss, you know, and I feel like with time and as I progress in my age, I get to um, to acknowledge it more, to be able to accept it a little bit more, especially the Afro-Latino side of it, uh, with so much racism and so much separation of what was and, you know, what is, and, you know, and how we can bridge, you know, those two cultures together and it be a part of, you know, who we are and how we represent it. So I thank you for acknowledging that, you know, um, many don't 
acknowledge that part of the Caribe. And I think it's a struggle for la gente del Caribe to be able to say, yeah, you know what? We are mestizos. You know, we, we come from a mixed culture. You know, it's unfortunate that, you know, the native Tainos and Arawakos are, you know, they dissipated, but they didn't. You know, it's just a, a mix of a whole lot of culture and being able to acknowledge it and say, we're still here in one way, shape or form. We're still here. But thank you for having me. I can't wait, yes. you know, for the rest of this platica to happen. But thank you for having me. I'm honored. Yes. You know, what a truth that we as indigenous people all around the world, right? sometimes get messages that aren't true. And what we have to do is to find out the truth about those things mm -hmm. culturally. And I know being Puerto Rican, that we were told this lie that there are no Tainos. And that is not true. Tainos are alive and well in the Caribe, in Central and South mm -hmm. America, the Arawakos. Mm -hmm. And I, I have been blessed to have been studying under a teacher, a maestro, Alfonso Peralta, that teaches the ways that are so difficult to find, right? We have to go find these teachers in order to reclaim our history. But we have a rich history. And the colonizers and the invaders, their agenda is to make us think that it isn't there. But it is there. We have a history that is materialized in, in evidence, and we have it within our bodies. And so can you talk a little bit about being a Dominicana, you know, culturally, what does that mean for you? You know, what is the richness that you feel that it brings for you? It's funny, my hair's just stood up all over <laughs> just by asking me that question. Like I said, being a first-generation Dominican-American is... It's unique, especially that I'm raising two younger daughters who are now third generation, you know, um, second generation, right? And I wear it on my sleeve. It's like, I can't, I can't deny it, you know? And it, it's a part of who I am and the way I talk, the way I cook, you know, the way I dance, you know, like it's everything about me. And some people find it really difficult, you know, to say, well, why, you know, when people ask me like, well, what are you? My first answer is I'm Dominican, you know? And they're like, but were you born here? Or, or they'll tell me like, wow, you speak really good Spanish. You know? <laughs> and I'm like, why wouldn't I, you know? But I guess it's because, you know, when I'm looking at both worlds, when I am in the Dominican Republic, and then when I am here, that I get these questions, you know? And I'm like, well, in my house, I learned English and Spanish simultaneously. And, you know, my both my parents are immigrant Dominicans. Um, they came in the early 70s. One came in 69 and the other one came in 70. And I have to tell you that I just didn't know anything else but, you know? And when I was younger, nosotros somos la palabra el patio, you know? When you're going home, ¿pa dónde tú vas? Para el patio, right? Oh, you know, oh, cuando tu va al patio, you know, because that means when are you going back to the motherland, right? When are you going back home? And it's interesting that, you know, for me, I feel blessed that I was able to go to El Patio every single summer of my life until I turned 15. You know, my mm. parents didn't have someone to take care of me. And says, como yo era la hembra, I was the girl, they would ship me to El Campo, you know, which is like... And it was funny, it was only me. It would be like six or seven of the kids from the neighborhood who were from the same campo that they would get one person who would take us to Dominican Republic and we would spend our entire summers there. But interesting enough, people's concept of me being in the Dominican Republic, it was like, oh, well, you were at the beach, you were hanging out. And I'm like, no, my grandparents were farm people. They had their own farmland, uh, you know, from platanos to alvejas, you know, we had animals and cows. And, you know, I used to wake up in the morning at five in the morning. My grandfather was like, a levantarse todo el mundo a trabajar, you know? So it wasn't all fun and games for me to be in the Dominican Republic and be like, you know, I'm at the beach. No, I was living the culture. I was living yes. and breathing the culture. You know, I was with my grandparents and I come from a very huge family. I have 24 aunts and uncles. Both my parents are a family of 12, you know, and my family is huge and I got to go to two sides of the island. So for me, 
it's a part of my every fiber of my being, you know, it, it, it's what I was taught at home. And, you know, when I was home, I spoke in Spanish, you know, I had no other way to communicate with my mother if I didn't. And my dad, even though he spoke English, we just spoke Spanish in our home. So to me, being Dominican is, um, you know, it's just who I am. It's from my hair to my skin color to how I talk. It's funny, I'm married to a Guatemalan, and when I'm in Guatemala, I sound Guatemalan, but when you put me together with my people, <laughs> it's like a whole different story, you know, because I talk the way my people talk, you know, but people find it hard to understand why I'm so connected to being Dominican. I don't say I'm American, you know? My hair is, I, I came to accept my Afro-Latina side um, when I became a teenager, you know, talking about colonizing, right? Um, my mom, when I was younger, always did my hair every Saturday, you know? To her, it was like, era el día para peinarse su pelo, you know? And I would sit there and she would blow it out and I had this straight, beautiful hair. And one day when I was 13, I just said, it is hot. I am not going underneath that hair dryer. There is no way in hell you're gonna put me in that hair dryer. And she told me, she goes, Gran Pajón, tu va tener, you know? She goes, watch, you're gonna be coming back to ask me to blow out your hair. And then I realized that I had this huge Afro, like these curls, right? And I was like, where did this come from? Like, I had no idea, you know? My mom is, has the exact same hair as I do. And to this, to this day and age, I've never seen my mother with curly hair. And I asked why, because in Dominican Republic, in El Caribe, we have a term that's used pelo bueno and pelo malo. And because of the African slaves that were bought, especially in the Dominican Republic, especially with, you know, with the split of the island between the Haitians and the Dominican, which is, you know, it breaks my heart because we're all one people. You know, the Africans were bought over as slaves. You know, they didn't ask to come here, you know. And the whole point was, is that if you didn't have white skin, straight hair, then it a mala raza, you know, and I'm like, why? I, I'm like, I don't get that, you know, and it's funny because we have to think about in the Dominican Republic, we had communism and was some point with Trujillo and él quería blanca la raza to the point that he was killing people in order to be able to whitewash the country, you know, and he, even himself, he would wear, he was, él era trigueñito, but él se ponía polvo, you know, he used to put white powder on his face in order so he could pass as white. That's why he always wore white gloves. You know, he never wore his hands free. And it was because he was hiding that part of our indigenous culture, that part of that mestizo culture with mm. African slaves being brought. So this has been indoctrinated, you know, within the Dominican culture that having curly hair, that being trigueño, you know, that it's mala raza. And it's one of the most beautiful things. People are going to the Dominican Republic every single year to go bathe under our beautiful sol, right? You know, to have these yep. beautiful complexions and they wish they had our hair like us. And here we are, you know, in 2023, and we're still struggling within our own race about que lo que es mala raza, you know? O que lo que es pelo malo. You know, so now I wear my pajón with pride, you know, I put my gel in it because, you know, I need to keep it. But at the end of the day, you know, <laughs> I'm proud of my curls. I'm proud that part of that mestizo is what gives me my melatonin in my skin, you know, like it gives me like all this stuff. And, you know, being Dominican is just something that's just in me. And I'm trying to raise my daughters the same way that they understand that even though they're born here, when people ask you, even to this day, you know, when people ask me, well, what are you? And sometimes to frustrate people, I'll say, well, I'm American. And they're like, no, 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 but what, what are you really? I'm like, I'm American. And they're like, come, come on, you know? And I'm like, you know what? I'm not good enough to be Dominican and I'm not good enough to be American. So what do you want me to tell you? And then they were like, oh, you see, you mm -hmm. are you are from someplace else. I was like, yeah. I said, but I was born here. And I said, that makes me American. So it's a little bit of a struggle sometimes because, you know, people want to pigeonhole you to be what they want you to be and not just that you be who you are. Right. So for me, que viva la bandera. <laughs> <laughs> que viva. My goodness, you, you articulated that so beautifully. Uh, and it's so sad that, you know, everybody wants to 
put us in a box, you know, and just there's so many beautiful facets to us as mm -hmm. mujeres that we have so so much medicine, you know, in every realm, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, physically, so many gifts. We're, we're granted with so many gifts and then to just try to be so one way or the other, it's so limiting. It sounds so limiting. And then knowing you personally and, and how big your spirit is and uh, just how you dance with life and, and, and whatever comes your way. It's, it's like, no, she can't even fit there. Like, like you're too big to fit in, in those two categories. You know, you're so much more than that. Uh, as as with many of our women of color uh, as well, all mujeres, you know, have so much medicina. Um, I know that in our previous conversations, you had a birthday, I believe. A few months back, and I'm coming uh, to another one soon. <laughs> I'm coming to you oh. in a few more months, but I'm coming into that new decade. <laughs> you're That's you're right. heading into that elderhood, uh, even though I think you've been there for a long time. It's just will be yeah. official. <laughs> it'll be yeah. official. But in, in in reflecting on that, and I'm sure you have taken some time to reflect, you know, as you're going to come into this next quadrant of your life. I was wondering if maybe you could share, because you have so much experience in so many different areas, but I'm going to give you some key words and see if anything hits for you as you come into this next quadrant in your elderhood. Uh, the word letting go. What is it that you want to leave behind that you, you don't want to, that God does you don't want to take with you into to this next quadrant? The power of empathy. And then the beautiful word that you taught me about, and maybe you can explain a little bit about that too, about compatience. <laughs> How we all need compatience. <laughs> it's funny. You stuck to that word compatience, and the last couple of weeks, I've been sticking to the word release and surrender. And I think that's part of that mm -hmm. let go. Yes. You know, um, mm -hmm. we carry so much of this baggage. But I think we need to start reflecting on how we're carrying that baggage and what we're going to do with that baggage. And part of it is letting go. You know, it's like forgiveness, right? When we think about forgiveness, right. it's about um, really about the person, you know, not the person who you people think, oh, you need to forgive that person, right? Or what have you, or the situation. It took me a long time to realize that forgiveness is really about me, you know, about how I let go of what's on my shoulders and what I'm carrying when it's not my cross to bear, when I've learned to let go of that cross, you know, and say, mm -hmm. take the experience from the situation and turn it into something positive and not carry that and let it go. So I think that coming into this new decade and this time, I've been really reflective of what is it that I'm carrying and why am I carrying it? What purpose is it giving me, right? Mm -hmm. And I really believe that with everything in life, it's a season, a reason, or a lifetime, right? You know, it, it's a season, a reason, or a lifetime. And when it's a season and it's fulfilled its purpose, positive or negative, even if it's negative, take the positive about it and just let it go because it taught you something, right? It fulfilled mm -hmm. whatever it needed to fulfill at that moment and at that time in your life. And I've learned that carrying all that weight is just not only emotionally draining, it's also physically draining. And it stops you from being able to reach another level, right? And then when something comes in for a reason, we think that we have control of our destiny. And we think that we have control right. of so many <laughs> things that happen in our lives. And I've come to realize that we don't. There is something bigger than us. Right. That has that destiny yeah. was already determined the day that I was born. Mm -hmm. And I realized that as much as I fight and I struggle, maybe the reason why I'm suffering, and it's because I'm just not letting things evolve and meet its reason why it happened in my life, you know? And this, you know, mm. I'm still in that reason and season when it comes to different situations in my life, but I've learned to through meditation, through prayer, that maybe I'm not allowing its fruition to come through because I'm too stuck on what is it that I want to have control over. So I've mm -hmm. learned to let go and just let it happen and then just deal with the consequences. I used to tell my mother this when I was a little girl all the time when I wanted to do something on my own and be like, yo, just let me do this, you know? 
en el refrán era un gustazo, un trancazo. If I enjoyed it and I lived mm. it, whatever the consequence to whatever it is later, is later on, it is what it is. But I lived it. I lived it and I gave yeah. it a chance. How many people are so afraid just to live or to just take a chance just because they're afraid of what the outcome is going to be? That outcome has already been determined. We just have to let it happen, mm -hmm. you know? And then mm -hmm. you think about the lifetime part of it, right? How do you take those experience for the lifetime? It's like friends. People come for a reason, a season, a lifetime too. It could be family, you know, your job. It could be everything. It could be anything. The point is, is that it's there for a reason, a season, or a lifetime. So I'm going to take my reason and my season to make my lifetime the best that it can be, you know, and that's where I'm at. I'm at this point that... I always question what I deserved and, you know, should I go for this? Should I not go for this? Should I do this or should I not do this? And I kept going and, I, and I, then I thought, well, maybe I don't deserve that. And then at one point I'm getting to that point that I'm like, yeah, I do deserve that. I've worked hard. Mm -hmm. I deserve to have that, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, I deserve to put myself in a different place. Yeah. As long as I'm not jeopardizing or hurting anybody else or myself in the long run. Mm -hmm. And I think that sometimes we forget yeah. about everything else that's around us. You know, and now realize that our actions do affect other things that are around us, but it doesn't hurt to be selfish. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we think selfish is a really bad word and it's not because sometimes people who are empaths, I'm an empath, right? right? We talked about the word empath, right. right? People who are empathetic are people who are able to take, 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 but also be able to release, mm -hmm. right? And the reality of yeah. it is that when we're clogged or so many things are coming at us that we lose that control that sometimes that's when things become mm -hmm. cargas because we're not learning how to release. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We need to learn how to release. Mm -hmm. We need to learn how to surrender and release. At the last circle that we had together with the Comadres Network, I have to tell you that, you know, Mara Susi and Mara Deborah, you, you, Maestas, you put it clear for me, you know? I didn't know how to surrender and release. I thought there was something wrong when I did that. Mm -hmm. Because I felt that it meant that I gave up, mm. you know, mm. or that I wasn't trying hard enough in whatever it is that was coming in my way. And then I was questioning and judging myself. And then I realized that I'm an empath. If I can take in and release for other people, then why can't I do that for myself? I deserve to do that for myself. And I come to you, you know, to the both of you to guide me. Right. And you made me feel that it was okay. And that there was nothing wrong with releasing, you know, I never thought that crying was for the week ever, because I really feel, I think you guys have taught it best. You know, I've learned so much from you where crying is a part of the body telling you it's looking for its way to release whatever those energies are for you to be able to let go, right? We have to let go. Mm -hmm. And then we have to be, let's go back to our word of compatience, Right. That's a big word. I'm not going to take credit for it. You know, I wish I could remember where I heard it from, but it was uh, another workshop that I had, I had attended uh, about self-healing. And one of the things that we have to be, we have to be compassionate individuals, but that comes with a lot of patience. And sometimes with the way this world is turning, it's like nobody has the patience for anything, you know, including myself, Right. right? And I think that when we're mm -hmm. in these situations where we have to find compassionate for others, you know, we have to be able to have the patience for those people or even yourself to come to their realization. You know, what things I think, you know, and they, they do this to your social work. You have to meet your clients where they're at. You got to meet them where they're at. And sometimes that takes patience because it's not about you. It's about them. So we should be able mm -hmm. to do the same thing for ourselves. Why can't we have compatience for ourselves? Why is it so mm. hard for us to do that for ourselves? And it's because, como el día de la mujer internacional, we were taught as women that we take, 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 you know, and that we're quick and that we resolve, you know, that we take care of everything as quickly, but we have no patience for our own selves, but we have patience for the rest of the world. So how do we change mm. that? You know, and mm -hmm. I think that one of the things like, you know, the cultura cura, you know, that has taught me is, is that you have to take time, right? That's part of patience. You have to take the time to feel, 
the time to process because that's when you understand. And when you understand, mm -hmm. you learn how to release, surrender, and let go. That's just it. Mm. It's easier mm. said than done. Trust wow. me. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Right. Wow. I mean, talk about a handful of teachings that just went out. You know, I mean, talk about provocation. If you heard what was just said, I know it's in your mind in many directions. You know, and, and we need to hear these things. Absolutely. We need to hear these different things that challenge us. This is what growth is all about. Mm -hmm. Growth is all about that reflection and looking at ourselves and saying, okay, in that little gap right there, I need to grow it. Strengthen those areas so that we really can become that reflection that, that we anhelamos, right? We, we desire to become. Yari, you know, you shared about your cultural identity and how it's innate in you. You know, it's not something you think about it. It's just something that you are. You talk about so much of the experience that you have been through in your life. And I know, because I know you, not only academically you're achieved, but also you have done so much work in the community. And this podcast, even though it goes out, worldwide, we want to emphasize the women and, and young women, right? And I know that you have done a lot of work with young women, women that have been system impacted, women in trafficking, women that have unaccompanied minors, you know, like you have uh, been in the work on the ground. And can you share with us how you implement those teachings in the work that you do? to elevate, to, to lift up the youth that you work with or mujeres that you work with? You know, all of the work that I've done, I just put the word empowerment in front of myself. All of these young girls and all of these women, they're capable. They just need to know that someone believes in them. Mm. And they need to know that it's okay for them not to be okay, right? You have to give them their space. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when they come, mm -hmm. like you said before, you know, I've worked as, you know, as a supervisor for the Ayuda Latina Hotline, you know, I'm working with human trafficking now. I've worked with gang intervention prevention work. And I'm talking about even when I worked with the Girl Scouts of Nassau County, you know, I did, you know, girls from five to, to 18, right? And now I, I work with adult women and they just want to be heard, you know, they need validity. I think we shame so much that what they went through, they're already going through their own shame. They already feel that they've been beaten and into the ground and that they're not worth anything, you know, and that because they've allowed whatever this injustice that's happened to them, you know, that, you know, this victimization that they've gone through, that it's already their fault because they allowed it to happen. That's just key number one, right? Is mm -hmm. letting them know and giving them that support that it's not their fault, that these situations that they've been put in they feel that because they make certain choices and that's why they're there, but they don't realize that some of this is generational trauma, right? There's some of the, like you said, like I'm innate, mm -hmm. this Dominicanism is innate in me. Sometimes living a life of a victim becomes innate because that's what they're born into, you know? Or their lives have, you know, it just kept evolving and evolving at every stage of their growth. What they need is someone to sit there and say, I understand, you know, be empathetic, be that listening. You know, people underrate listening so much, you know, they just want to be heard. You know, um, like we do in the cultura cura, right? One of the things that we learned is that we don't give out tissues, right? You need to let people feel. You need to let them be in that moment at that time. And if whatever great being has brought, brought us to be together in a room, for me to listen to what you need to release, then my job is to be able to validate what it is that you're feeling. My job is to validate that what happened to you is real and that it's not your fault. But most importantly, that that is an experience in your life. It doesn't make who you are. And when we can get people, women, young women, all women to understand that when things happen to them, anything good or bad, it's an experience at that moment and at that time. 
what you do with it afterwards, yes, it may help you make certain better decisions later on, but it doesn't define you. It doesn't define you. And they need to be reminded of that, that whatever happened to them is not their fault. They're entitled to feel how they feel, but that there is an opportunity to change. That when they're ready to sit at that table, and it's a process, this is not a cookie cutter solution to these, you know, different types of victimizations that the, the population that I work with, you know, experience. Everybody experiences differently because it depends how they handle it, right? But at the end of the day, it's about being sobrevivientes, you know, que ellas sí son sobrevivientes, ellas no son víctimas. You're not a victim because if you're still here and you're still standing, then that makes you a survivor. So we need to make that switch to have them understand that if they're standing there and they're telling you that story and they're telling you what they're going through, that they're not a victim, that they're a survivor. And we have to get them to see themselves at that moment, at that point, and realize that that one experience that they have does not define the rest of their life. It doesn't. And I think that through the work that I do, that I've been blessed to be able to do this, I found this late in my life, right? I've always been someone that was just a little kid, always giving, taking my clothes off of my bag, always, you know, but when I went to college, you know, social work wasn't for the people of color, you know? Social work was for other people, not for people of color. Very, you know, uh, minimal Mm -hmm. people of color were going into this field when I was in college, you know? And I came to still do all this advocacy work just on my own time and because I felt that I needed to help people heal, right? Because I'm an empath. I was born an empath, you know? And finally, you know, in my adulthood, way after careers, I realized that, you know what? Me too. I still have the opportunity to go and do something else for myself and be able to gain those skills to be able to help people who can't help themselves. You know, and I went to grad school and, you know, I graduated at the age of 47 and, you know, it wasn't easy, but I knew that I needed more to be able to continue to help more. So I think that, you know, to answer your question, Maestra Deborah, is being that listening ear, giving them that space and letting them know that it's okay, but don't let that experience define what the rest of your life is. That's just an experience. That's un grano de arena in your life. It might be, you know, a big grano de arena because I'm not minimizing Mm. anybody's, you know, pain and suffering, right? But if you think about un vaso lleno de arena, that, you know, for every little experience that you've had in your life, you know, another piece of sand comes over it and the sand builds, right? And it's like, you know, like these are the days of your life, you know, what was the name of the soap opera, right? Days of our lives, right? (laughs) 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 <laughs> how old are you no. now, now you're dating but all of us think about that right think about these are the days of our life we never look at you know i have to yeah. tell you this just came to me like right. I, and i'm literally seeing the commercial with the hourglass right that's one grano yeah the arena in that whole big vase of everything else that has happened in your life so for me again being mm-hmm. that listening ear allowing them to feel and validate their feelings and then empowering them that there's more to them than just that. And then how can we get you there? I'm not going to tell you how to get there. I'm going to help you get there, but I'm not going to tell you how to get there because everybody's path is different and everybody needs to be where they need to be when they're there. And we just have to work with that. Mm -hmm. It's not easy, but, and sometimes it's heartbreaking, Mm -hmm. you know, and (laughs) When you see people in Manas yes. who are stuck, yeah. you know, and Absolutely. they see no way out and, and you see the helplessness and the despair, that's what motivates me. That's what pushes me because I know I can see what they don't see mm-hmm. and I want to get them to see what I see. Mm-hmm. Mm. Beautiful. I, I know that, you know, the work that you do and, and a lot of us that are devoted to serving in any way that we can, you know, whatever way that creator puts these situations in our life, put these people in our lives. We all have the best intention of helping and in a way we can of showing up for people of being that support system in whatever way that they need. When creator brings these mujeres and and these beautiful mujeresitas in our life. But I know personally for myself, because we do give so much, there's so much energy going out and then it's always a struggle for me to 
remember about balance and, uh, you know, when I'm overdoing it and when to step in, when to pull back and take care of my own health as well as, and be, like you said, selfish, but or even not even selfish, but care for ourselves. how important that is, mm-hmm. especially if we want to be doing this work for a long time. But there have been those moments I have to be serious and, and honest mm-hmm. where I really question what I'm doing. And I'm just, um, you know, having a hard time. And I, I'm wondering, is it time for me to step out of this now? Or is there still more of me left to give? Or am I even making a difference? Is it time to just pass the baton? You know, what is that? I, I've had that at different phases of my life where I question that. And, and I'm just feeling depleted. And I know that that has a lot to do with because I have went past my threshold about my energy you know that's usually what triggers it but but when i get to that point it, sometimes it, i get stuck and if i don't take care of it i'll keep spiraling down and questioning other things and other things and other things but i know in having those experiences the pattern for me that i've seen when i get there now at this point in my life creator is so generous so gracious you know and so affirming and confirming that um, whenever I get there now, and if I think back through the years, whenever I've been there in the past, Creator will always be so gracious to put somebody in my path and just spread all this grace and light over me and confirmation and affirmation. And, you know, Creator uses people to do that, you know, and it's such a beautiful, beautiful gift of grace when that happens. And, and you get that mm-hmm. extra medicina that you need for when you're feeling that low. I'm wondering, I know there has to be because of all the, the mujeres and mujeres that you've worked with through the years. Maybe you could share with us what is one time maybe that has happened and you've been graced with that, that beautiful medicine when you needed it most. You're right. There are times when we're like, hands up, you know? Enough is enough, you know, and, and again, I don't know if this yeah. is coming into this new decade or, or what it's doing, but, you know, like I, I have this conversation with my husband all the time. I'm like, babe, I'm like, I can't do this for the rest of my life. You know, like, when is it going to stop? Right. And he looked at me, he goes, you know, it's never going to stop. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, you want to fool yourself and think that it's going to stop because it's never going to stop because you can't help yourself. And he was like, because someone in the time of need, we'll find you. He goes, you can hide in the darkest Absolutely. corner of the earth and someone that needs light will find you in one way, shape or another. And, you know, and I think about that mm-hmm. because I've gotten to a point that I'm like, I'm done. You know, like I need to pass the baton, you know, um, people younger yes. than me should be doing this. I have a re- Why do I keep getting sucked back in? to doing like teaching work or lecturing or workshops, you know, about teaching people about X, Y, and Z, right? It's because somebody needs to hear it. Mm-hmm. Somebody needs to hear it. And the right. creator is choosing for me to mm-hmm. to resonate, right? But it has happened to me where I've, you know, even for the sake of my own children, you know, I've thought to myself, it's time for me to be selfish and focus on my family and not be out there. And I think the light bulb hit me twofold. Once was when my own daughters turned around and told me, we need you to. Mm -hmm. That was a big one for me. When they said to me, we need you to. Yes. They were like, I'm Mm -hmm. not probably being gang banged in the Mm -hmm. corner. I'm not homeless. Mm -hmm. I got a roof over my head. I got parents who mm-hmm. love me. I'm getting an education and I really shouldn't be complaining about anything. But I'm going through my own stuff too. And you're not here. And I need you too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And because we think that we have give all of these mm-hmm. necessities, right? Forget about the materialistic things. It's about being present. And mm-hmm. that's what they were asking of me. Right. That they needed me to be present there and that mm-hmm. their life was moving along. And that I was not there. So that was the one time in my selfishness state mm. that I mm-hmm. had to, because we don't think about our families as those in need that we have to serve, right? 
Right. And it goes twofold. And I'm going to mm-hmm. tell you a little story later mm-hmm. on about what happened to me yesterday. But in this instance, it wasn't about the people, right? It's always about the people outside of my little, you know, my my little home, right? That I was not giving them what mm-hmm. they needed. And the fact that they had a voice and said, we need you too. And we're moving along and you're not here. Mm-hmm. So I had to find a balance to be able to fulfill my need to be present in my family's life, be there for the things that they're going through. And just because they have all of these materialistic things to yeah. keep them safe and sound, I found out that they weren't safe and sound. Because lo que se ve de afuera es diferente a lo que se siente mm-hmm. adentro. Right? That doesn't mean that my kids didn't experience bullying. That doesn't yeah. mean that my kids didn't experience racism. You know, mm-hmm. like... And here I'm thinking that because yeah. I'm living this white picket fence life, that they're shut from that and they weren't. So for me, that was one of them. I had this mm-hmm. one um, young lady that I was working with, very difficult, you know, very difficult. And she would not let anybody in. I mean, even now, like she, I, I'm still connected to her in different ways, even though it's not part of the work that I'm doing right now, but I'm still connected with this youth. And I couldn't understand the hatred that she had towards someone. I couldn't fathom it, you know? And at first I was like, this kid is helpless. Like, I don't know how I'm gonna gonna help this kid. I have no idea how I'm gonna help this kid. I mean, I saw this kid elevate, literally physically elevate because of all the anger and the hurt and the pain that she had, that she literally physically elevated from a chair. Because that's how much power it had over her. Wow. And I said to myself at that moment, I can't do this. I don't have what it takes to help this kid. You know, I, I don't, I, and I don't know what. Prayers and prayers and prayers, all I kept thinking about because I didn't know how I, I was going to help heal this kid, you know? And the mere fact that she never wanted to talk to no one, she would never look for anyone like, I'm telling you, this kid, you would come to her house and she would jump out the window because she wasn't going to deal with you, you know? But the mere fact that she would let me in and she would let me sit with her was enough. Was enough. It showed Mm -hmm. her that someone cared about her. That even though she could yell at me, she could scream at me, Mm -hmm. she would curse at me, I would just sit there. And again, as the empath that I am, I would just collect it all in. You know, because that was me giving her space. Mm -hmm. That was giving her that space to be, and and she knew it, you know, and she would apologize sometimes. And sometimes, you know, she didn't want to show that she cared. However, about a year passed and I had not seen her and I was at an event and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Miss Yari, and she came and she gave me a hug and she gave me a kiss. And she's like, I miss you. I haven't seen you. How are you doing? And I didn't know how to react. I was like, how are you? You know, inside, I was like, what's going on here? Right? Because (laughs) there were times that she would tell me to F off. You know, she would tell me she did every, she, her, her purpose in life was to make no one like her, that she was so damaged Mm. that she did nobody deserved to have her in their life. So she made it possible for everybody that came into her life to make them hate her because she didn't feel that she deserved to be liked or to be loved. Wow. And for me, I took that challenge. As difficult as it was, I took that challenge because I just knew that she wanted someone to tell her that it's okay. I just knew that she wanted someone to tell her that they loved her, you know? And... She wanted the person who's Mm -hmm. supposed to love her the most. She did everything in her power to make that person feel that they were the worst thing ever on this planet. And she, she did a really good job at it. You know, I, I, I empathized a lot with that person too, because on the other end of it as a mother and as a person, I I just couldn't fathom someone Mm. hating me that much, but it was, she didn't hate her. It's just that she was hurt. She felt unprotected and she felt undeserving and she felt unloved. Mm -hmm. And all she wanted was someone to love her. Mm. That's all she wanted. 
mm-hmm. you know? So for me, I think those two yeah. situations right then and there, at that time with that young individual, at one point I was like, I think I'm done working with youth. Like, I was like, yep. It's like the, you know, the nail in the coffin, you know? And I was like, I don't think I can, you know, that was just, right. you know, and I think about her all the time. And I have to tell you, she pops up in my life in different ways that it's incredible, you know? And when she mm-hmm. sees me, the you know, even though she tries really hard not to smile, but she gives me that look and that's enough for me because I know that she's telling me, thank you. And yeah. I don't need her to tell it to me. She just needs to look at me. That's it. Yeah. Mm. That's powerful. Wow. That's, that's beautiful. And, and it's so true, right? Because, uh, you know, you said that word a couple of times, right? We don't feel worthy. And when we don't feel deserving or worthy, mm-hmm. then we do that. We make, you know, a situation where we're not going to be treated well, mm-hmm. where we're going to push people away, right? Because of that yeah. hurt that we feel so deeply inside. That's a very touching story. Yadi, because I tell you, when we're having these conversations, <laughs> yes. time goes so fast. I know it. It's just like, <laughs> oh my God, we just got on and we already have the gear to get off. But in thinking about your life experience, right, and thinking about this next generation, what would be some words of consejo that you could offer to this up and coming next generation? And also, what are words of encouragement for the elders around? Um, that are going to be transitioning. There's a lot of mm-hmm. us because estamos bajando de la montaña. And so mm-hmm. what what words can you offer to the elders that are out there, you know, in this time? I'll start with the youth. I think you need to be true to yourself. Just be true and authentic to who you really are. We live in a world where we want to make everybody else happy. And that comes with a lot of sacrifices of oneself Mm -hmm. when you want to make everybody else happy. And we end up losing who we really are and what values we have, you know? Mm -hmm. I think, especially within our cultura, you know, with the second and third generation, it's like, I think some find it a little too late in their paths because they're so used to being molded into the world that they're in, that they have to fit in, you know, and be a certain way. And... Sometimes that is sacrificing who you are just to fit in, right? And if we think about like kids are getting bullied and and why, it's because they're being their true selves, right? And really, if you really think about it, right, the reason the person is getting bullied is because the bully is the one who is, I personally look at it as they're seeing something from that person that's so true that they can't do it themselves. So the only way they can feel on top of that person is by bringing them down because they can't be what that person is at in that person's true state. So I really, you know, want to tell, you know, Mm -hmm. young Latinas out there, you know, just our young generation is think about the values that you're raised with. Learn from your elders. You know, I'm going through a little struggle right now where even with my own children, you know, they're like, this is my experience, not yours, right? That reminded me of what I used to tell my mother. Déjame caer, como yo voy a aprender. If you don't let me fall, I'm never going to learn, right? And now it's coming back to me where my Mm -hmm. kids tell me, you know, and even the kids in the street, you know, they're like, but this is my experience. This is not yours. How am I supposed to learn if you don't let me experience what I need to experience? So go ahead, experience. But you know what? Take the knowledge and the experiences that us elders share with you. It's not for us to tell you what to do. We're just giving you a word of caution. So you can be prepared for those things that may come your way that you may not be able to know how to handle, right? So take the advice, you know, if nobody's telling you how to live your life, it's just advice, you know, just based on life experiences. For our elders, I think, especially, you know, uh, when I first really started getting into my career, I noticed that a lot of the people who worked in my circle, I had a lot of great mentors and had a lot of great elders, but they didn't know how to let go. So what ends up Mm -hmm. happening is, is that then the people are coming in to be able to prove, and using that word lightly, prove that we did learn from you, right? We did learn from you. 
we're living in this world now and have faith that they're going to do what's right. It may not be the way that you did it, but it may be the way that it has to be done, but it still gets the same point across at the end. So have mm. a little faith. Let go. Mm. Let it go. Right? I'm not a singer, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> have faith. And if you have faith, then you have to let go. Because what ends up happening is like micromanaging. What happens when yeah. you micromanage someone? More mistakes are done because mm-hmm. the person who you're micromanaging mm-hmm. is constantly questioning if what they're doing is right. When you're not letting them do what they know is right and let that carry on. So for me, I think for, like I said, a young generation, you know, there's a reason why we're here. There's a lot of the teachings that I've had from that campo when I was five, six, 10 years old, 12 years old, that I still take with me today. Just work ethic. To get up in the morning and do something that you may not yeah. love every single day, but you got to get up and you got to do it, right? Because people got to eat and we got to eat too, <laughs> right? And to our elders, mm-hmm. you know what? We can learn a thing or two from our youngins, you know? They're living in, 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 in a different world that we grew up in. Yes. It's okay for us to learn from them too because they do have something to bring to the table. It's about eating at the table collectively, Mm-hmm. And be able to enjoy what everybody brings to the table for the greater good, right? Because the intention is all about intention, right? Everything that we mm-hmm. do in our, in our world is all about intention. And sometimes we just have to listen and say, what is the intent and what are we trying to achieve? And how can we achieve that with the experience of our elders, but with the skill sets of our youngins? Because together, we can accomplish so much more for our community. Wow. Wow, thank you. Thank you for those words. Comadre, I I mean, we have a young women's curriculum and we work with women that are, uh, you know, facilitate groups with young women. And we work ourselves with uh, mujeres and young women. This uh, conversation today has really, really uplifted the work that needs to be done and that is being done with our young women, right? Right. What are you thinking, Mother? I'm thinking I'm, I'm just going to ask her when her new book was coming out. Because <laughs> I want a copy. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm not being funny. Like, yeah. I'm serious. I like, yes. So that, that just your, your way of articulating mm. it and, and putting that imagery and that visual to it and connecting all the dots uh, in such a, a beautiful feminine essence way i think some people are better performers <laughs> than writers <laughs> <laughs> uh, no and it's true but i, I want to tell i want to give you guys credit with something um in my personal growth i know that we're, 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 we're strapped for time but i i want to tell you that i think that one of the biggest blessings that i've had in my life was having the compadre network come to new york mm. you know um, mm. the sacred work that we were doing in that community mm. and that we continue to do in that community, what you guys brought to the table really exacerbated our skills, gave us a different outlook on how to work with our own people. And sometimes we didn't take our culture enough into effect because we're so taught by this is what the book says, right? And this is how you're going to heal these people. Mm -hmm. And the cultural competence is such, now it's being brought in more. Mental health is now being more awareness now, right? And then bringing the cultural part into this, you know, the cultural competency into mental health, you know, is like the buzzword, right? Let's say, you know, ever since COVID happened. Mm -hmm. But I have to tell you that I took this course before COVID and what it has brought into my skill set and how I work with our people and how it made me have to be more in tune with myself and how culture plays, not just because I'm a proud Dominicana, but how it plays in everything that I do and how I interact with people. Like even my my hand talking, this is not a New York thing. This is like a Latina <laughs> thing, you know? Um, <laughs> you know, um, I think that You know, I'm very grateful for what that has brought into my professional career and what it has brought into my personal career. Mm -hmm. 
you know like people don't understand when i say well you know i took a course and you know i took took, and i refer to oh i have these maestras right and they're like well what do they teach and i'm like you can only be so privileged so Mm. i want to thank you Mm. and the compadre network you know and the compadre network too who are able to help me give me these extra tools to be able to spread this healing that we're looking to do within our culture, within our community, because I really think that it just put me at a totally, like at a different level, you know, and I've taken it, you know, from when I started at the other organization and where I am now, and they were also part of that, even though I wasn't part of that organization at that point, and now I am, and this is a part of our daily work. And, you know, we open all of our staff meetings with palabra, you know, <laughs> so now it, it's just, now it's part of that ingrainedness that I have uh, uh, that skill and it's because of you ladies wow. and because of the Compada Network so I want to thank you so much for bringing this into my mm-hmm. life because it really has helped me really become more in tune I've always been a spiritual person but it just took me to another level it really did so gracias oh wow thank gracias you to Dios. you and um and you know you alluded to La Cultura Cura and we are very grateful Mm-hmm. that we have the maestro of that, which is Maestro Jerry Teo. And, you know, and everything mm-hmm. is based on those four values, which is love, dignity, respect, and trust. And mm-hmm. on that, we've got to end this beautiful conversation. No. I just want, I know, <laughs> just want to thank everyone for listening today. And like I said, I know you heard something here that really made a difference in your life today. And thank you for joining us. And so with that, we're going to say bendiciones. And in Arawako, which is a Taino language, abimirumi, bendiciones to all of the listeners. Comadre? Yes, comadre. So grateful. Thank you so much for all your medicina today, Yari. Uh, The closing words, compatience, empathy, Mm. release and surrender with faith. Adelante. Gracias. Uh. Ashe. Gracias. Thank you. Bendiciones. For more information about Healing Generations and the Healing Generations Institute, visit nationalcompadresnetwork.org and be sure to subscribe to stay up to date with our new releases.